Welcome everybody to WOLA. Uh, very happy to see all of you here today on a crazy week where we have uh, tons of Latin Americans here um, raising a lot of different issues. However, we thought uh, with Ted Picone of Brookings and Camila of uh, Connect Us that it would be very important that we ha at least have a short event to talk a little bit about what's been going on in Brazil. So, Jair Bolsonaro's election in Brazil sent shockwaves throughout the world. He was a fringe member of the Brazilian Congress for many years, and he ended up surging up the polls in 2018 and won comfortably the second round of voting against the Workers' Party candidate Fernando Haddad. Even before he's been formally inaugurated, we have seen some very problematic things happening. Uh, for example, waves of hate violence, including attacks against the LGBT community, women, people of color. We've also seen um, that many Brazilians are feeling empowered to act violently after listening to a lot of Bolsonaro's hateful speeches. His harmful rhetoric has been very well documented. Among that rhetoric, um, he told a female representative in Congress that he wouldn't rape her because she was very ugly. Um, he proudly told the media that he'd rather his son die in a car accident than have him show up dating another man. And he's also stated that nothing in Brazil will change until there's a violent civil war with at least 30,000 people dying. This rhetoric prompted uh, various members of the US Congress on November 28th to take advantage of Bolton's trip um, to Brazil to basically urge him um, to help curtail this type of hateful speech and also um, to alert everyone to the fact that um, the United States and the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights must closely monitor the human rights climate in Brazil uh, because this rhetoric is likely to lead to further abuses against marginalized communities. Um, interestingly, the members that signed this letter included um, the LGBT Equality Caucus. It included uh, well-known um, activists on the Congressional Caucus for Women's Issues, as well as uh, Gregory Meeks, who's been outspoken on Afro-descended issues. So in addition to the threats that Bolsonaro is posing on human rights in Brazil, <laughs> there is also a major concern that um, he is likely going to cause irreparable damage to the Amazon area and that climate change as a whole, the advances that had been taken by Brazil, are going to take a major step backwards. In this vein, he's very much in the same line as uh, President Trump. So uh, with the administration installing itself now in January, um, it's been very clear that what he plans to do is to increase agribusiness, um, which will lead to severe deforestation um, in the Amazon, and that he's likely going to give contracts to some of his most fervent campaign supporters. While he has not yet been inaugurated, we already see that the numbers in terms of deforestation have gone up. Uh, because these signals are basically giving a message to everyone that um, they will be able to do this with impunity. So his cabinet choices are also a, a cause for concern, and I'm hoping that our panelists can tell us a bit more about that today. Um, but just to close by saying that um, it is more important now more than ever that we are all vigilant to what's going on in Brazil, that we start monitoring uh, what type of arrangements are made between Brazil and the Trump administration, and that we start holding um, this new administration accountable for its actions. So to talk a bit more about this and to give us um, expert insight on what is going on, we have two amazing um, experts here. Uh, to my left, I have Ted Picone, who is a senior fellow in the Project on International Order and Strategy and the Latin America Initiative in the Foreign Policy Program at Brookings, my former uh, place of employment. 
Um, he has done so many different things. I'm not going to list them all. But um, he was a senior foreign policy advisor during the Clinton administration. He's served on National Security Council staff. He's written several very important books um, and reports. And he's also more recently been also working on transitional justice um, issues in Colombia. But he also worked on the UN Truth Commission in El Salvador um, and for um, US Representative Bob Edgar. So we're very much looking forward to hearing what you have to, to say, Ted. Also, we're taking advantage of the fact that Camila Asano is here with us. Um, she is the coordinator of the Foreign Policy and Human Rights Program at Conectas Human Rights, a Brazilian NGO with a national and international agenda, close partner of WOLA's. Um, Connecta's work includes mostly advocacy initiatives on the role of emerging powers in strengthening of international human rights protection and also on issues of accountability in foreign policy. She also is a professor of international relations at the Fundação Armando Álvarez Penteado, which I probably just destroyed, I apologize, in Sao Paulo. <laughs> so I think with that, we're gonna start with Camila. Welcome. Hi, hello, good morning to all. First of all, I want to thank Wola for hosting this event and have the chance to talk about my country. Uh, I'm Brazilian and I'm still trying to process what happened and what will happen to my country. So it's very good to have this opportunity to have a discussion with you and also with Ted, which is also a good friend. And we've been discussing Brazil from the golden times and now in this difficult moment of Brazil. So it's really good to share this hard task with you to talk about Brazil and the future for at least next year. Well, Himana already mentioned some of the um, um, quotes of the elect president, Jair Bolsonaro. As she was saying, he mentioned recently that he would rather prefer a dead son than a gay son. He told to a parliamentarian with, who used to be the Minister of Human Rights, Maria do Rosario, in the Congress, like inside the Congress, that he wouldn't hate, rape her because she was too ugly, so she doesn't deserve to be raped. And um, he also said that black people in Brazil, especially in the communities called quilombolas, whereas the traditional communities in Brazil, descendant of this labor community, that they should be weighed as cattle. So using arrobas, uh, which is the ones that we use to, to weigh goods and animals. And he's also someone that's worshiping dictatorship in Brazil. And one of his idols is General Ustra, General Ustra, who is one of the main um, head of the Brazilian dictatorship torture system that we had. So when we have uh, compiling these quotations of the new president, uh, we say, okay, so we had 55% of Brazilians voted for him in the second round. And in Brazil, voting is mandatory. So some of the people ask, okay, so all of them voted because of his positions on gay rights, on women's rights, on, and no. And I think it would be interesting to discuss and go further on the reasons why he was elected and why people voted for him. But I think we don't have that time now, so I will more focus on the impact on the implications for human rights. But I wouldn't say, and I'm not comfort to say that people voted because of all that he said. But the problematic thing is people voted despite what he said. So this is something that we are really, really concerned on, on what to, how to deal with this, because human rights are no longer um, the red lines in Brazil. This is more like a question we don't know, but for elections, for sure, it wasn't relevant enough to make people change their votes. Um, so looking forward, now for his inauguration is 1st of January, so very soon he will become the Brazilian president. So what to expect uh, in Brazil? 
One of the things is, for now, we have a huge lack of clarification of what will be exactly the priorities of Bolsonaro uh, administrations. We have some hints and we have many signs, but to know exactly what will be the measures, the concrete measures that from f January 1st we will have to deal with and probably fight against this, it's quite difficult for many reasons. The first reason is the manifesto, we call the plan for government that uh, all candidates in Brazil are supposed to formally present to, to the electoral justice in Brazil during the election period. The manifesto he presented is very broad, so it's really difficult to find the the um, the proposals and what is he's actually um, seeing and planning for for public policies and for defense or for anything, you can find some of them, and those that you can really identify are really problematic. And I will mention some of them, but this is one thing why we have still a lack of clarification because the manifesto is quite poor concerning details and concrete proposals. The second one is also something that Jimena mentioned about the cabinet. Uh, he appointed almost all the cabinet, it's still missing two names, which for the human rights ministry and the environmental ministry, but it's not f confirmed that we are going to have these two ministers. Um, so if you go to the cabinet, or especially the top names in the, in the list of ministers, uh, we see, I don't know how you, s you s say it in English when you have like the arms that you know, queda de braço. Sorry? Arm wrestling. Arm wrestling. Arm wrestling. <laughs> Arm wrestling. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Anna. Uh, yeah, so it will be a huge arm wrestling in the top um, core of the Bolsonaro administration because on one side we have the army and the vice president is a former general who left the army to go to the campaign. So he's really like almost inactive and very, very influential in the army. You also have Paulo Guedes, probably you heard about his name many times, because Paulo Guedes then will be the Minister of Finance and he is a neoliberal one and will be central, will have a central a role in Bolsonaro administration. You have Judge Sergio Moro, who was responsible for the car wash uh, operations, and who, who is very punitive and is going to be the Minister of Justice. And you have all the conservative base for that elected Bolsonaro and is also present in the in the administration, the core of his new. Uh, the power in, in Brasilia. So you have people from religious uh, background, especially the evangelicals, that's the new Pentecostal know, evangelical uh, groups in Brazil. And you have some other very conservative voices that are, um, are very present in the, in the cabinet. So the manifesto is not clear. The cabinet, it's appointed but you have like m different forces there and you don't know we don't know who is gonna be you know the higher voice um, in this new government and also you have the tweets which you also have <laughs> so it's very difficult to understand tweets it's very difficult to understand interviews from Bolsonaro and his uh, advisors the close advisors especially he has three sons and they are very active advising him. So you get like con opposite message. We have some like pills of messages <laughs> and it's really, really difficult <laughs> to understand <laughs> it. So this is why I'm saying that, well, it's not clear how it's gonna be and which agenda, if it's the environmental, if it's the public security, what will be the priority, but we know that we're gonna have like a tsunami of change in Brazil. And, and concerning human rights, um, what we are sure is that human rights are under enormous attack. And the attack will be coming from the executive bran branch, but will be supported by a conservative and renewed Congress. 
so in Brazil we had elections for the pres for president and for Congress, both Senate and uh, House of Commons. So if you look at the House of Commons, it changed uh, in a very concerning way. For instance, the party of Bolsonaro, which is PSL, um, used to have one member, one seat at the Congress. Now they have more than 55 seats and it can even change because they're still doing the calculations for mm -hmm. distributing the seats, which means he, the, this party is the second largest one in the House of Commons. So uh, the check and balance in Brazil will be, uh, uh, well, we, we are not gonna be able to count on check and balance on many, many issues and bills coming from the executive branch. So Congress will not be a place really to, to block um, setbacks on, on human rights. And I, hi I would like to highlight four areas where we think that human rights are especially under attack, will be especially under attack. And this is not new. So I'm not saying that we are used to be in a perfect country, not at all, but not even in a good position uh, uh, in terms of human rights. So we've been seeing in Brazil a wave of setbacks and destroying some constitutional rights and guarantee rights for the past years. And I'm not talking only about Temer administration, even in Dilma. And also in some areas with Lula administration, we saw some weakening or even attacks to constitutional rights and even to guarantees that we had. But now we know that we are reaching a dramatic point uh, in Brazil. So the four areas, the first one is public security. So I'm just highlighting and maybe if there's any area that you would like to go deep in, we can discuss after afterwards. But Public security, um, public, uh, police lethality, and police violence. And this is a big concern in Brazil. We have the police that most kills in the world. And it, the trend is to get it even worse, especially because we had elections for president, for Congress, and also for governors. And public security is a matter for the states in Brazil, for our federalism. And in very uh, important states like Sao Paulo and Rio de Janeiro, we had elected uh, governors that are publicly defending um, extrajudicial executions. Like in Rio de Janeiro, we had Witzel, Judge Witzel, who is also the same from the same party of Bolsonaro, and he's defending, he said that he will put snipers in the city to shun the head of anyone carrying a gun. And we are talking about favelas, which is a very crowded place where you have kids going to school, you have mothers going to pick their kids at school. So this is one of his uh, main proposals. And in Sao Paulo, we have João Doria, who was elected governor, and also saying that police should sh shot first and then go and check what was happening there. So police lethality is a major concern in public security. The second one is militarization. And, and this era, we had a military intervention in Rio de Janeiro that will come to an end now in the end of December. But the use of military forces in public security is a trend in Brazil. And, and we, we believe it's gonna grow and grow from different uh, states in Brazil. And also one of the main flags uh, and campaigns for Bo from Bolsonaro is uh, reducing arms control. And of course, he's using the US as a model for what he believes is the best way to, to have, to deal with arms in, in the population. The second area is social environmental. So you're saying about Amazonia, and this is one of the few concrete proposals and measures that I found in the manifesto <laughs> that is limiting environmental licensing. So he said that it, he wants this to have maximum three months 
length. So it's impossible to have a proper environmental assessment and process of licensing in only three months. So this is in the program of government uh, of Bolsonaro. And we know that many companies, private companies and also state companies abroad are very happy with this. So this is a challenge for us, how we can deal with this knowing that many companies are kind of delighted that it will be easier to do business in Brazil concerning environmental limitations. Um, the other one is indigenous and traditional communities and the right to land and the marcation. We had a process of, and the constitution guarantees the land for indigenous people and traditional populations. But we we believe that it's going to just stop and even remove these territories from these indigenous people and communities uh, in Brazil. And again, linked to this idea of growing economy and provi um, promoting Brazilian companies and promoting investments in, in Brazil. And also some change in slave work. Uh, it's also part of one of uh, the the measures he's uh, designing. The third uh, area that we are really concerned is democratic space. And here it's hard because now we have to defend ourselves as NGOs and social media movements uh, for even exist. So freedom of association is a concern now. And this is quite new in Brazil. We had many attacks to human rights defenders, criminalization of social movement, but the preservation of uh, freedom of assembly became like a huge concern in Brazil. Uh, and because for instance, one in between the first round and the second round during the election, Bolsonaro uh, gave an interview and he said that he will put an end to all forms of activism in Brazil. We don't know what exactly what it is, but he said exactly this, I will put an end to all forms of activism in, in Brazil if I'm elected president. Um, and also because we know there is a global trend to shrink civic space, especially using measures to limit access to funding. And Bolsonaro, after uh, the elections, he had conversations with the Hungarian president, Viktor Orban. So, and we know that Hungary is uh, implementing many um, measures limiting the access to foreign funds for, for NGOs, which act basically is killing many organizations or forcing them to leave the country. So this is something that we are really concerned um, also, the criminalization of human rights defenders, this is not new, but will become even dramat more dramatic. We had, of course, the case of Marielle Franco and Anderson Gomes, a case that I, I believe you all know that was a very prominent human rights defender from Rio de Janeiro and also a member of the legislative in Rio de Janeiro City, who, who was killed this year. and. Um, we still, after months and months, we don't have any clue about who are the responsibles for for her execution. Um, and the criminalization of human rights defenders is also coming from the Congress. So the Congress in Brazil, under Dilma administration, it's good to highlight, adopted an anti-terrorism law, which uh, has a uh, opens the possibility to criminalize social movements and human rights defenders. But now there are some bills, there are some bills in the Congress to make even worse this legislation, to make it easier to criminalize human rights defenders. So you have the problem of the freedom of association, per se, plus criminalizing the individuals and all the conservative agenda. So, and this is a result of all the influence of this religious group, conservative religious groups in politics. So we are talking about uh, ending e equal marriage, uh, weakening affirmative actions, or limiting even more the cases of legal abortions, because in Brazil it's a crime, unless it's a result of rape or put the risk of the mother, uh, in, um, 
is a risk of the mother health or if you have an ancelic uh, fetal. But there's a chance that we will even limit more the possibilities of legal abortions and the freedom of professors and teachers at school and universities, which uh, we call the Escola Sem Partido. It's school without political party or party. It's even hard to translate because it's so absurd, but it's happening in Brazil. And all of this started because Bolsonaro was elected in October, but we'll, his inauguration is only in January. But f after the elections, all these kind of bills and proposals, they gained force and started to move fast in the Congress. So we are, we are living the, the facts already. And the, the last um, area that I would like to highlight is the multilateral, human rights multilateral bodies and system. So during the campaign, he mentioned that he would leave the Human Rights Council, the UN Human Rights Council. Um, it's not clear at all what will be our foreign policy, so I'm glad that Ted has this <laughs> impossible task to talk about the future of the Brazilian foreign policy. Because as I said, we have uncertainties all around I mean, many aspects of the Brazilian politics now, but foreign policy especially, it's going to be really, really difficult to, um, to know. And well, I have many questions for you, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> so that's more or less how we are reading at Connectors this scenario, and we must be ready for this. And just to not end in a very pessimistic way, just to say how we intend to resist and we will resist. So first is to make sure that civil society will be protected because despite all this attack on freedom of assembly and freedom of association and even criminalization of human rights defenders, we will need to have even lawyers. So we are working with lawyers in Brazil to make sure that they are ready to you know, do our legal defense, even like uh, in this, like this. But to resist, I would point out three um, institutions. Uh, one is the democratic institutions. As I said, Congress, we cannot rely on much on the Congress because um, probably he, he will, Bolsonaro will have uh, huge support in many um, agendas. And also because we believe that Bolsonaro will use uh, medidas provisórias, which is quite similar to your executive orders in the beginning. So uh, there's not like a demonstration of respect to democratic procedures and rules, so probably Congress will not be a place. But I'm not saying that we are not going to work there. We will, and also we had some good news in our legislative election results. So we will work on that. But the Supreme Court <coughs> became a big player. Well always has been always a, a, an important player but especially now to protect at least the the rights uh, that we we had in our constitutions and the ones that are already guaranteed so the work with the supreme court will be extremely important um this the second uh, institution well the second player is the press but bolsonaro started already to attack the press especially folha de são paulo because Folha de São Paulo published uh, a story denouncing the use of WhatsApp, illegal use of um, WhatsApp in the campaign. And he said that once he's president, he wants a Brazil free of Folha de São Paulo, so directly attacking this newspaper. And like he organized, convened a press conference uh, after elected, and he forbid uh, Folha de São Paulo and some other newspaper like Globo and San São Paulo to attend this press conference. So <laughs> this is really, really serious what's happening. So we need to strengthen the national press, but especially the foreign correspondent in Brazil and call for the attention of the international press. We had, but it's still like we had economists publishing the cover saying that Bolsonaro would be a disaster for Brazil. We had The Guardian, we had many you know, international communication companies taking a position. We still need to have them like this. And the third players, 
international players. So this is why I'm so happy to have the opportunity to be here to talk to you, because uh, we'll need the solidarity and the cooperation and collaboration from international partners. Because um, even for pressuring uh, the new administration concerning this change that I just mentioned, but also f for protection. So for instance, uh, we will need embassies and consulates in Brazil ready to be safe space for human rights defenders. If we need to go and ask for protection, these consulates and embassies should be with their doors open for us. And also think about emergency funds for protection and things like that, because it's not just a matter of pressuring for against negative changes in the human rights agenda, but also think about the protection of the people uh, that will be fighting for rights and because of that will be under threat and intimidation in Brazil. So yes, that's, that's it. <laughs> wow, well thank you very much for um, your presentation. It's a very sobering um, set of facts. Um, so Ted, please. Yes, very sobering. Uh, welcome to Washington, where <laughs> <laughs> this all sounds very familiar. Uh, so uh, we can we can talk about that. Uh, thank you, Humana and Mad and Mola, for helping to organize us here. And I hope we'll have a conversation. I won't go on for too long. Um, but let me. I want to say just two minutes on the domestic um, political situation and how we got where we are but really then focus on some of the foreign policy uh, points. In my, in my view, watching trends in the region and specifically in Brazil, it's not that surprising that someone like Bolsonaro got elected. Um, if you looked at the polling, very high levels of public rejection of establishment parties and, and particularly against the Workers' Party. Uh, and, and politicians, a lot of anger toward the gross corruption that's come out through the Lava Jato and other investigations. And of course, a period of economic uh, recession and austerity uh, that also generated a lot of uh, anger toward the government. And don't forget that Brazil does have among the highest levels of violence in the world. So tremendous amount of popular concern regarding uh, public security. Um, the Bra Brazilians were not only dissatisfied with democratic governance as it was playing out, but also more open to non-democratic alternatives, and that came out in the polling. Not majorities, minorities, but a significant uh, increase uh, in that direction. And I think Bolsonaro came on the scene and captured all of these anti-establishment sentiments and ran on a very strong anti-corruption, um, nationalist, pro-military campaign, strong uh, on public security as well. But clearly his rhetoric went way beyond the norm uh, in, as we've heard, his attacks on minorities and women and some just core human rights principles uh, that are well established in Brazilian law and constitution. Um, and clear, as you said, it wasn't a strong enough factor to get voters to reject him. Um, and I think even more surprising on the campaign trail was his embrace of uh, President Trump and the whole idea of this anti-globalist foreign policy. So now he's not in office until January 1st, but it's almost like he is in office, it's kind of similar to Mexico, where already putting a cabinet together and signaling uh, certain trends. And I think uh, we have a general idea of where it might be going. Um, so in Brazil, it doesn't mean that it's the end of uh, the need to build coalitions. I mean, he will have to forge a lot of different um, fa factions to make something work. And they are, there, there's going to be tensions within arm wrestling and otherwise. And it'll be interesting to see whether Bolsonaro follows his instincts, which we know something about from his many years in, in the Congress, or if he's uh, amenable to uh, moderating some of those views. Um, so you see on the economic side, very pro-free market privatization uh, elements. 
uh, hard line on public security, a number of uh, retired military generals who are being placed in critical positions, uh, not only the vice president, uh, but the Ministry of Defense, uh, the uh, most senior person responsible for national security uh, is very close to Bolsonaro and I think will play an important role. Uh, if I recall correctly, the Minister of Justice has said he would like to appoint another retired military as the head of the police, if I recall Public correctly. Okay, Public Security Secretariat. So clearly there's a strong uh, move in that direction. I think with uh, Moro as Ministry of Justice, there'll be a continued focus on the anti-corruption. That could be a good thing if he is able to maintain independence and in, um, how that goes forward and allowing the courts to maintain uh, independence. Um, and then on foreign policy, really a full embrace of a nationalist uh, approach along the lines of Trump and Bolton. And don't forget, uh, I think in particular, uh, one of Bolsonaro's sons, uh, Eduardo, seems to be the lead on, on that, met with Bolton uh, and uh, here in Washington, I think we'll see more of him. So I think it's really uh, not surprising that people are referring to him as the Trump of the tropics. Uh, I think there's a lot there. Um, I think when you look at it in the context of Brazilian foreign policy, you know, which is over the years tended to be a highly professional, careerist uh, force within the Brazilian government uh, and not overly politicized, although I think it's fair to say that during the Lula Rousseff years, there was a strong tilt toward a more leftist orientation in their foreign policy. Um, nonetheless, you have uh, career people who are among the best in uh, diplomacy in, in the world. But what, what is it that gave Brazil this image of a rising power uh, in the world? And it's largely built on their soft power. You know, Brazil doesn't have a big, powerful military. It's not, extra, it's not um, throwing its weight around in the region particularly. Yes, it's grown economically, but lately having a lot of trouble. So it's really a matter of um, Brazil's appeal to uh, international law, international norms, including human rights. Um, its belief in multilateral cooperation, negotiation, uh, always coming out, for example, at the UN Security Council, at the UN more generally, against uh, the use of force internationally unless it's been approved by the Security Council, you know, religious about, about that point. Um, so when you hear what you're beginning to hear from this new team, it's really quite a dramatic change and we'll, uh, we'll have to watch how it plays out. At, at that level, um, but without that kind of soft power, you know, I think it's um, uh, the election of Bolsonaro and how he, what he represents, is already a diminishment of their soft power, uh, and then what they're uh, likely to do going forward will affect their ability to really uh, influence international rules and and relations. Um, you know. Uh, I think we did have an interim administration uh, under Michel Temer, and I'd be interested in knowing your views on whether Temer's period was um, kind of lost time or whether there are some things that can be built on from the Temer era that um, might moderate where uh, Bolsonaro might go going forward. Uh, now, the, the pendulum uh, swing, uh, all the way right in Itamarti, the foreign ministry, um, because of this appointment of uh, Ernesto Fraga Arujo, uh, who is a career diplomat, but uh, in full embrace of the Trump doctrine of nationalism. Um, and he's likely to face a lot of internal battles with the careerists, but it is really remarkable just how um, atypical he is of the HMRT mindset. Um, and just to give you a couple of examples, in a paper that is highly cited, and I suppose more recently he's still echoing some of these points, he, he referred to Trump as saving Western Christian civilization from radical Islam and from globalist cultural Marxism um, by standing up for national identity, family values, and the Christian faith as Europe has not. 
Um, and he talked about Brazil now having a chance to recover its Western soul um, and uh, embrace Trump's nationalism and really pursue national interests without regard to uh, alliances or ties to other nations. Um, so that's quite interesting statement. It's like strategic autonomy on steroids. Um, it'll be, it's, it's very atypical for Brazil, so we'll see how far that goes. So a couple of predictions. Um, on the regional side, uh, I would, if Brazil really does get its act together and these factions are able to coalesce, there are going to be contradictions uh, for sure. You know, on the economic side, you're going to see one approach that really won't be so easy to reconcile with this nationalist approach because Brazil is very dependent on export of its uh, agriculture and iron and other raw materials, and I can't see that going away uh, anytime soon. They just can't economically. Um, but in terms of, of the region, um, I think clearly we're already seeing it in alignment with the United States on, uh, and perhaps on, with Colombia on Venezuela and on Cuba and, and Nicaragua. Now, depending on your view on those three countries, uh, this could go very badly, or it could be useful. Uh, you know, from a human rights perspective, my own view is that there's no question that these three regimes are among the worst abusers of human rights in the region. Um, so if Brazil became more active uh, in, say, the Lima group on Venezuela and to try to really bring, solidify regional um, uh, action against Maduro, uh, and maybe even go so far as imposing sanctions, which again would be atypical for, for Brazil if it's not approved by the UN Security Council. Um, you know, this could put more pressure on Maduro to come to the negotiating table and try to find some kind of uh, resolution of the crisis there. Uh, in Nicaragua, uh, I think Brazil could do more to speak out against uh, the Ortega regime's uh, intensifying repression against its opponents, uh, as we continue to see, including recent attacks on independent media. Um, and again, try to pressure uh, the government there to enter negotiations to resolve the crisis. I don't think it would go so far as supporting some kind of military uh, intervention or action. So I, I really think there will be some limits to how far uh, Brazil, uh, just as there is here. I mean, there's very little support here in the United States uh, for that kind of activity in uh, either country, Nicaragua or, or Venezuela. On Cuba, it's very interesting to see. Um, we're already seeing a, a major shift uh, with the, uh, the, the action that Cuba is taking in response to Bolsonaro's uh, language to uh, re return its doctors uh, to, to Cuba, uh, which was a really important source of income. For the, for, the, for the government in Havana. Um, and it's interesting to see how the Brazilian government or the incoming government is using human rights grounds uh, to uh, argue for this. Um, you know, uh, Bolsonaro said, we can't allow Cuban slaves in Brazil and we can't keep feeding the Cuban dictatorship. Um, it, it is true that uh, through this arrangement, the um, Cuban government receives payment for the services of their doctors. And the doctors themselves receive a very tiny fraction of, of that payment. So the, the Cuban government says this is how we fund our healthcare system. We export our doctors and they're well received around the world. And um, uh, you know, in general, I think the Cubans get a lot of positive um, feedback on their medical diplomacy. But this is a different argument that we're hearing. Turning a little bit beyond the region, um, specifically on China, um, I think they've made it clear that Brazil will distance itself from a closer strategic partnership with Beijing, although I don't think it will go so far as damaging its important economic and commercial ties. Um, question whether it means pulling back from the BRICS coalition. Uh, perhaps you'll see greater Chinese, I'm sorry, greater Brazilian vetting of Chinese investment in critical infrastructure in, in Brazil. Um, there might be other steps like that, but at a minimum you're going to see a break being put on any kind of closer uh, uh, Brazilian Chinese ties and uh, we'll see if it goes much beyond that. Now, I have a 
particular view when it comes to human rights on China, and I've just written a paper on this that looks at China's increasingly confident role at the UN on human rights, and where it's now moving from defense to offense in asserting its own model of state-led capitalism and one-party rule as the preferred model for protecting human rights. Uh, and some of this is actually getting traction at the UN as China grows economically and has real leverage and influence with a number of states uh, around the world. So it's able to move uh, countries in this uh, direction. And you know, whether Brazil steps up to challenge China on the human rights front, I think it's unlikely given what their own record will be. Uh, but. Uh, it does raise the question of who will stand up to China as they become uh, more confident on the world stage and assert this kind of uh, Chinese model. Uh, a, couple, a couple of other small points. Um, Russia, I, I mean, I don't think we're going to see closer ties with Russia, which might be a good thing if you think of Moscow's dangerous behavior and meddling uh, in its own neighborhood and in our own country. Um, clear embrace of Israel, uh, you know, that's a real change and the moving of the capital from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, we'll see if it actually gets implemented. There's a debate within uh, his advisory team about this, uh, but I think signaling to his domestic constituency and the evangelical community in particular that we want to be much closer to, to Israel. Um, Iran might be another area. Uh, I haven't seen that yet, but you know, interesting to see whether they will clearly align with the U.S. Uh, against Iran, uh, whether on the nuclear matter, which Brazil is not central to, but could still um, be a rhetorical voice of support for the U.S. position. Um, you already mentioned Hungary. I, I think you'll see these closer partnerships, alliances with other populist leaders like uh, Orban in Hungary, in, in Italy, Duterte in the Philippines, perhaps Egypt, um, as we've already seen with uh, the United States. If you look broadly at the region, what's interesting is you see this um, sh sharp move to the right in, in Brazil, and similarly in Mexico, a move to the left. Uh, and it'd be very interesting to see whether um, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador becomes a counterweight to, to Brazil's um, uh, nationalist position on these. I, I'm not counting on it. I, I don't think that AMLO really has that kind of ambition. Uh, I think a lot of people are hoping that he will fill the void in the region when it comes to um, uh, the left, but he's also very strong against intervention. He tends to be much more of a nationalist uh, on these fronts. Um, you already mentioned climate change. Uh, you may have heard that Brazil has canceled its commitment to host the next uh, COP25 in, in Brazil. Uh, I think in part this plays to not only to the environmental, I'm sorry, the uh, pro-business community, but also within the military, there's a very strong uh, you know, protection of the Amazon as our sovereign uh, patrimony. Uh, not, it's not a global patrimony, it's our, it's our sovereignty. Uh, and I think that may be part of the, the climate change uh, argument as well. Uh, you mentioned withdrawing from the Human Rights Council. Uh, you know, I think over time, Brazil has been on the fence a lot, but over time they've tended more toward support for human, important human rights initiatives at the UN level, so, so that could go away. That's not going to be helpful given the way things are, are shifting uh, within the UN. But I know one thing that a lot of the military generals that are being appointed to these senior positions have served in very senior positions in peacekeeping operations, uh, particularly in Haiti and the Democratic Republic of the Congo. So this I mean, the theory is that this kind of exposure and experience really enlightens uh, military officers toward a much more globalist point of view. So it, it'll be very interesting to see how that plays out, if that will be a moderating effect um, when it comes to Brazil just withdrawing from all kinds of UN uh, operations. So, so bottom line, I think we are in very much uncharted territory. We haven't seen this kind of 
uh, Brazil in three decades at least, and even even then, I think it would be hard to draw the parallels all the way through to where we are now. Um, and I think, as you made the point, that there's going to be a really important need for the international community to monitor and condemn uh, what's going on in in the country. Uh, and unfortunately, I don't think the United States government, the executive branch, will be much help. But I do think that the Congress especially now with the change in the House, uh, could be a very helpful voice, and I'm sure Wool is going to be thinking about how to uh, uh, be engaged on that front as well. Thanks. Great. Well, very insightful. Thank you so much, Ted. So let's open up for a round of questions. I think we have about 10 minutes or so. Camila, we have to go 10 minutes? Okay. Just identify yourself, please. Oh, okay. Other questions? Uh, I have a question uh, relating to the case of Maria Franco. It's a case, obviously, that we're working on very closely. And I was just interested on your reading yesterday at the American Commission hearings. One of the commissioners specifically asked, you know, they wanted to see progress on the case. Um, and, you know, the government pretty much didn't respond, saying that, you know, there's investigations, but you know, that they're keeping that information clear. Is that something that you've heard routinely from them? And kind of where do you see that there could be additional pressure? Which specific government that we can keep on targeting to get more answers on that? Thank you. Uh, Lucy Murphy, uh, 1DC Black Workers Center. What is the role of Soka Gakai International in Brazil in all of this? OK, let's take one more, and then we'll do another round, I think. So, yeah. Lots of really interesting questions. Who wants to start first? Yeah. Camila? <laughs> <laughs> um, OK, so on WhatsApp, uh, yes, he will continue to use this kind of communication. And also, one of his sons is the head of the communication strategy. He said that he would leave this position, but it's not clear that he will actually leave it. And this is central. One of the reasons that I mentioned we can go on why uh, Bolsonaro was elected, one of the um, explanations could be that uh, he uses um, easy language, which sometimes people, and this is a very interesting, if I may say, phenomenon, like people that voted for Lula voted for Bolsonaro. Which like, and we had some researcher, including Esther Solano. I, re I strongly recommend her research and study on Bolsonaro supporters. And she interviewed many of them, and the young, especially the young supporters, they say oh, um, he has a pop style. So he used mem mems, you said. He used like different. Um, which is quite pop and easy to understand. And if you, when she interviewed older supporters, they said, wow, he's someone like me. He talks like me. I can really understand what he's saying. Because Fernando Haddad, the opponent from PT, he's a university professor. So, you know, he speaks difficult. He talks about theory. Well, and Bolsonaro, we really can understand. This is one reason what people said. So we believe, like, this kind of communication strategies using WhatsApp will be continued to be used. And some of them are just fake news. And it's really hard to break it. So one of the things we are saying in Brazil is that, well, for sure, we need, uh, f especially from the human rights community, the, again, we need to break the bubble. We need to communicate better with the people. But also, we'll have to deal with this kind of fake news and fake information that will be produced massively. 
and to have like cold blood say okay this is not something that i will spend my time because we will have to really choose the battles otherwise we'll be crazy and we'll be wasting our time in something that is horrible but maybe will not become a reality while meanwhile other things and other reforms will be adopted and approved on marielle Marielle Franco, well, what you saw at the Inter-American Commission hearing is what we have in Brazil. Like, we are always, all the time, asking, and Amnesty is doing a great job in pushing uh, the authorities to solve the case. And it's more than 10 months after the execution, and still what we hear from the authorities is uh, the investigation is going on, and it needs to be... Uh, in secrets because of uh, to protect the investigation and there are some attempts from the federal government to get the investigation and the responsibility for it but for now the state of Rio de Janeiro is in charge of the investigations what we need to do is not forget about it so keep pushing keep speaking about the case especially the international community because it was even you know, beautiful to see the reaction across the globe when she was executed to honor her and to call for justice, but it's disappearing now. So we need to continue doing it, and I'm sure Amnesty is an important player in this. Um, Lucy, I I didn't get your question. Who is the group you? Yeah, I'm afraid I don't, I'm not familiar with them. Sorry, I will, if you can later talk to me, it will be good to, to know more about it. Okay. And education policy. Uh, well, we heard some, since everything now in Brazil uh, will be influenced by these new liberal economic policies, there are some concerns about privatization of education this is one concern it's not in the, ma in the manifesto it's not clear but this is something that we need to be uh, aware of because in brazil we have public uh, univ superior education like uh, the university we have public universities very few compared to the the number of students but still this is something but one thing for sure that uh, under education uh, area is this Escola Sem Partido, which is the school without party. I don't know. Anna, how do we translate it? School without party. Yeah, doesn't make sense, but this is <laughs> it. And the, the fundamental idea of Escola Sem Partido is that um, teachers at elementary school and also professors at the university, they cannot um, doctrinate mm -hmm. students. So ideology must be withdrawn from education. And by ideology, they including talking about sexual education. So we wouldn't even be possible to talk about domestic violence and gender issues in education. And even questioning some of you know, historic facts can also. And it, it is already creating uh, a, uh, an atmosphere in schools of students recording professors and or even kids recording teachers and pushing and this is a platform from the evangelic caucus in the congress it's not new but again after the election it gained force and it's moving quite fast at the brazilian congress mm. and well and during the, the election campaign the electoral process we had the invasion of universities because the electoral justice allowed the federal police to go into public or private universities uh, to search for electoral documents and papers saying that the university was serving as place for campaign, electoral campaign. But in this case, we had the Supreme Court in taking a very good position, deciding on prohibiting this kind of incursion in, in the universities in Brazil. Well, I don't know, Ted, if you want to add anything? Or cool? Okay. 
Okay. Um, any other questions or comments? We'll do one final round. Matt. Well, uh, thank you, Camila, to Minister for moderating. It's very insightful. Um, a few weeks, 10 days before the election uh, in Brazil, we, we hosted a group of uh, Brazilian uh, civil society leaders and human rights defenders. And aside from just saying, tell us everything you know about what has worked or hasn't in countering Trump, you know, but help us in the next 10 days. This doesn't happen, but they all do. The writing was on the wall. Um, there's so many obvious comparisons that one wants to make with the situation here, and you, you, you highlighted that, Ted. As U.S.-based civil society or Congress considers using those equivalencies to take action, are there any particular where you think they really truly are the same and what we've learned for better or worse here is applicable, or others that may appear to be the same, but they're false equivalencies and we, shouldn't, we should be cautious about drawing those comparisons? Let's take another one. Wiza. Um, Wiza, I'm telling you that Africa Now and that's the World Now Project. So if you could expand a bit more on the, the role of the evangelical movement, and especially in Brazil being traditionally Catholic, how that is played within this context of uh, the rights. And I also had one other question. <laughs> we expand a bit more on the militarization aspect. I think um, we've always been, it's been only 30 some years since the last military coup. How has the military embraced democracy in whole and to lead you to this, considering that both narratives uh, background being a little bit? Matt Temple from the Center for Economic and Policy Research. Um, what should we make of Sergio Moro taking this position as the uh, uh, defense minister? But he said very clearly previously that he wouldn't go into politics partly because of the implications of what he was his efforts to, to, to convict Lula. So, I mean, is this payment to do that? Um, what's his motivation to take the role? What's his plan, his aim, if he has got one? And what's Bolsonaro's motivation? And what's his expectation as to what, what he will do in that role? Okay. Any last questions? Yeah. No? Okay, mm -hmm. great. So, Camila. <laughs> or Ted. <Get? laughs> no. <laughs> Uh, on this comparison, U.S. Trump and Brazil Bolsonaro, I think, yes, we have to be cautious and not to simplify things and to really understand that in Brazil we have a different, like our democracy, it's quite weak and we're still consolidating it. Uh, and also because we are very different countries and the weight we have at the international level and also the dynamics of our economies. But it's good, and especially it is good to take some lessons learned from you. So that would be really good um, to know. Uh, one of the things that we we know and it's gonna be really hard to put in place is to not respond to all comments and all declarations because uh, it will, well, we'll feel it in the gut, you know? It's gonna be really difficult. But again, we, we say like, it can be a smoke curtain. Is mm -hmm. this how you say? Smoke yeah. screen. Smoke screen. And we have to be really focusing, okay, what is a measure, just populist measure or just, you know, rhetoric, and what is really change that will put Brazil more and more close to an authoritarian regime than a democratic regime. So changes in the Supreme Court um, format, for instance. He, there's a moment that he was saying, well, maybe we should increase the number of judges at the Supreme Court. Well, and your question about uh, army embracing democracy, the vice president, General, General Moro, he said that during the campaign, he said, well, constitution, the, cons the Brazilian constitution should be uh, renewed, but we shouldn't call for an assembly, constitutional assembly at the Congress. <laughs> well, actually, maybe a small group of, you know, illuminated specialists should write the new constitutions. So these kind of measures are really serious and breaking um, and destroying the bases and pillars of the, the democratic regime. Um, so please give us some lessons learned. <laughs> um, the evangelical movement uh, is for sure a political strength that we must understand uh, in Brazil. And one of the things is to stop using the discourse of, of us against them and really trying to 
build some uh, bridges because there, it is possible. And there are many progressive groups, there are ecumenical groups, there are part of these churches, and they are willing to, to have discussion. But we see uh, a very intelligent uh, strategy like putting, uh, presenting some of the members and priests as candidates for Senate and for Congress, and they're growing, the, we call the Bible Caucus in Brazil. Uh, the press, so if you look at the how major TV channels are were bought by churches and they have like these really relevant places to spread their messages and also at the international level so always when I travel I see Brazilians all around because we have Brazilians all around the, the world but also I see many of these churches uh, Igreja Universal Assembleia de Deus there are some that we are actually exporting this so this international uh, cooperation is something that we have to, to understand and I know that for instance the Labour Party that lost the elections, they quite late decided to try to understand the evangelical uh, movement in Brazil. So doing even surveys and promoting focus group and trying to understand because in Brazil, the, it is uh, still a Catholic country, but the poor part of the population is evangelical. And usually the poor, poor part of the population is was the, su the support uh, electors for the Labour Party, but it's changing a lot. So it's kind of, you know, we need really to understand and to get close to these groups. Um, Moro, the Judge Moro, um, it is quite difficult to understand his, uh, his agenda, why he accepted it because he was always denying interviews that he would become candidate, say I'm not a political person, I wouldn't run for a uh, electoral position. But he accepted to be the Minister of Judge Justice. And in the first interview he said, but I'm gonna be a technical servant. I'm not gonna be a political animal there, which is impossible, we know. And he's already doing politics, like calling the go the Congress um, president to move on on a, another bill to strengthen the anti-terrorism legislation. This is one example. So for Bolsonaro, it's good because he's embracing this fight against corruption agenda and bringing it to, to its administration. But again, it's difficult to understand how strong will be Moro's voice and influence in this government, since you already have the generals there, you already have Paulo Guedes there. So he's another arm in this mm. triple arm wrestling. <laughs> Just two quick points. One is on the um, role of the military and its effect on democracy and broadly civil military relations. I mean, uh, here you have such an alignment between the view of the civilian side of the government and uh, the military that there shouldn't be really much of a challenge in terms of uh, civilian control. But uh, I think you might see ways in which the military will influence uh, the agenda, both domestic and foreign policy, that could be very dangerous and undermining of basic democratic standards. Uh, so I think we have to keep our eye on that very closely. Um, the one small thing that you might see, you know, Brazil, I don't have a statistic right in front of me, but Brazil is an important exporter of, of weapons uh, and of other arms. And you could see a, a, a growth in support for Brazil's role as a manufacturer and exporter of, uh, of arms. And I think that would be something to, to watch out for and to see that might even be a project, a mini project, to see how um, the arms flows are moving and a way to create some arguments and wedges uh, with Israel as well. Um, and then what's the same with, with Trump? I mean, I think we have to learn from each other <laughs> in these situations. And uh, there is incredibly vibrant civil society in Brazil. Uh, but 
to the extent you're dependent on foreign funding and that's going to be a, a target of attack, that is uh, of great worry, obviously. Uh, we don't have that problem as much because uh, so much of it is domestic sources. Uh, so there are going to be differences. But in general, the need for solidarity, it seems to me, has never been more important. And this might be ways of creating a, um, a U.S.-Brazil partnership at, at a societal level that we really haven't had so much. And when you look at uh, the role of Brazil and U.S. relations with the whole hemisphere, I think this is kind of an opportunity, if you want to see it that way, uh, to really build up a closer U.S.-Brazil people-to-people uh, relationship. Well, um, I think that obviously this is not going to be the first conversation on all of this. Uh, it's probably going to be the first step towards a joint strategy, and I'm sure Connectus, you can totally count on WOLA to be supportive in any way um, that we can be in terms of helping protect space. Um, with that, I'd like everyone to give a round of applause to our wonderful speakers. <laughs>